-hmm. I know the universe is endless, but what's on this planet seems to just, the variety, the multiplicity seems to be um, a, an enormous richness that, that, that's more than, than you expect. Maybe that's more as you get older you sort of appreciate it more. But the more you're exposed to it, the certainly the more awesome it seems in the, in the real way. When I was uh, starting out in this uh, field, uh, there was the pop art explosion. It was like all kinds of stuff to look at. And then we slipped into the psychedelic, and there was more images. I, I don't think there's, uh, you know, I don't think it's uh, that big a difference, to tell you the truth. A journalist, I was trained as a photojournalist, and now when you go out in, in international scenes, everyone is documenting the event. So I, I think the proliferation of images gets to a more truthful view internationally as a, as a journalist. I think that we need to communicate more as human beings. And so this proliferation of, of images is only an attempt to communicate. And we all need to, to have our um, time to communicate. But these, the, the archaeological proliferation of images, I just think it enhances my life in terms of the wealth of, my God, somebody made this design over and over again on the edge of that dress or in that piece of gold jewelry 5,000 years ago or in Burma or in Greece. And I know, whoever thought that of that form? So it's the forms that keep astounding me, that, that there's still more forms to be thought of. And when you look in nature, I think you find the same thing. If you look under seas and you, you look at some flower forms or you have the opportunity as a photographer with looking at magnified images, my God, look at, it, it really, it, it seems to be endless. So it, the proliferation of images to me is great. I see arts, I go, I use the internet a lot to search out other artists, to talk to artists, to, to get information. Um, I had to retrain in everything that I did because of the digital world. My training was obsolete. And uh, so I think that uh, the proliferation of images only helps us communicate uh, as a world. And, and there are serious photographers doing a great job documenting um, people, events, things that I would never see. Good point. Technology means that images is, are everywhere. What I find is we have too much information in the world and that also includes images. So what we have to learn to do is sort out what's important to us and the things that inspire us as artists and leave the rest aside and focus on the kinds of things that will help us get our own message out and express what we want to say. There are many, many, many great illustrators out there doing work in all kinds of mediums. And, you know, I'm always looking and looking, and, you know, in the, in the kids' book world, which I've done lots of kids' books, but mostly for this one publisher, I did over 40 kids' books, riddles and jokes and stuff like that. Well, when I look through print annuals and go to Barnes & Noble and look at all the stuff that's going on, I think there's just a lot of good people out there. It's a tough question. I'm not really sure what's going on in the world. The pottery does tend to reflect the uh, custom of the area where, where it's being made. Um, there'll be um, embellishments that are very specific to a certain culture. Um, Japanese ceramics, which I love, very different from American ceramics, but American ceramics are influenced by Japanese by British. We're all influenced by each other. I think it really has more to do with the, the, the potter, with the person creating the work, and what influences them, what catches their eye, what becomes an inspiration. And I know my work is um, very often influenced by um, the Asian ceramics, the simplicity of line, um, simplicity of color. Although I do some things that are heavily embellished, so I kind of float between two worlds. Well, there seems to be a really uh, 
eclectic mix that um, is, you know, all over the place. And a lot of it, you know, it's tending toward performance and other kinds of uh, venues. Uh, but um, with my own work, I've always I sort of stuck to a certain uh, way of working, and it's evolved through that way of working. You know, I mean, if you see the work I did maybe uh, 15 years ago, it's really, uh, there's been a big change, but if you look at it as just somebody coming upon and say, oh, this just looks just like that piece. And that was done, you know, 15 or 20 years ago, but um, I see a big change. I see the trend of the circle. This is what I see the trend of. I see the circle going like this for a decade or two, and then I see the trend going like this for another couple of decades, and then I just see this happening. And it, and it all, and then sometimes you might, you know, uh, uh, you know, you go to a gallery in Chelsea, and, and you might see something that you were looking at in the 70s. Art is, is, a, uh, is an important tool to keep us sane. I mean, how otherwise we can go crazy if we're, for example, hungry, we're going to go, you know, murder each other. A, an artist's a, a duty is to, to keep the humanity within us and to show us things that we're accustomed to see in a different angle, from a different angle. So it is uh, an important tool to, to convey, uh, to convey uh, uh, truth, to convey uh, uh, <clears throat> honesty, and uh, to convey a message that has to do with our everyday life. Did I go on a tangent? No. The experts are no longer even asking the question, quite frankly. I don't even think they're asking the question anymore. Uh, there's no such thing as a school of art, okay? But the, the, question, the question that uh, uh, is being asked over at Bard's Curator School, for example, is uh, how do we put together what we think is art in, in a way that raises important questions for the viewer of, of the entire exhibit, whatever it is. Uh, and you know what? I'm not so sure that hasn't always been true. Uh, you know, 100 years from now, they're going to know exactly what we're doing, and they're going to know exactly who has been successful and uh, who, who isn't, all right? But no, anyone who's actually there doesn't, hasn't, hasn't a clue. Well, one of the things you, you had mentioned is uh, how styles change. I really believe when styles are created, whether I can come up with it in the furniture design format, people did not decide that this is going to be the style I'm making. For instance, shaker furniture. Shaker furniture was not designed specifically by shakers to create a style. They, they had a need to make sh furniture. They had a very simple lifestyle. Their... their uh, uh, lifestyle was very unfancy, unordained, and they made it clean. It took somebody a good hundred years afterwards to say, you know, all of this furniture looks alike. Let's call it shaker furniture. Uh, so one of the, the, what is the style of today? It's hard to say. We're going to have to wait 50 years or so to decide what somebody calls it. You know, I see myself as a maker. I mean, the urge to make something, to take a pen, a paper, to hit a wall, to draw on a stone, to, to paint a canvas, to make something is somehow a primal urge with some people. If we had two rocks and one tree and one island, I think you would still make something out of one of these rocks with the other one. I mean, that's just, I just see that as something that's part of our, our nature. When you look at the, the caves in France and you, why did man pick up a brush to put an image on a wall? I mean, there's no value. I mean, why? There's nothing in that innately. Um, what's the payback? You know, what is the return on doing something? It's not like you put a seed in, you plant something, and you're eating that. You're not taking a spear and making something die so you can eat that. You're somehow... It's a sacred performance, in a way. Yeah, I'm the last person on earth. Everything is left behind. You're not trying to please anybody? I'm not trying to please anybody, dude. Listen, I'm not trying to please anybody at 2.30 in the morning when I come in here when I can't sleep. Who am I trying to please? I'm trying to please myself. 
I gotta come first. My art's gotta come first. It's got to. And if it doesn't, people make art for all different kinds of reasons, you know. And if I don't make it for the kinds of reasons that I have, I'm, I'm not who I am. Well, since I am the last person on earth, uh, let me see, what, what am I, flo what's floating around on my, uh, well, uh, let me put it this way. I'm, wor I'm, I'm, uh, I'm doing a little, I'm gonna be doing, I'm starting the sketches now on a painting for the uh, uh, View of Saugerties project. And so what I'm doing is I have a restaurant in town uh, called Miss Lucy's. I'm gonna try to do a sketch of the outside of that restaurant, a, a painting rather, and put one of some person I work w with in, in the front of the store. And I just gonna call it something like Willie in front of Miss Lucy's. If I was the last person on earth, I would absolutely still take pictures. I enjoy recording the beauty of the Hudson Valley. It's a privilege to live here. It's a uh, privilege to be an artist and I would, I would record. Um, I'm fascinated by the cave pictures that were done out in Utah and with very few people living at that time uh, that we know about and they recorded their lives in, on paintings on the wall so I would definitely take pictures still. I, I think if you were the last person on earth I think you could create art. If you were the pers first person on earth I don't think you could. And the difference is that if you were the last person you would still have the memory of interacting with other people. Well, I would do something, I'm sure, because I know I'm always setting things up just uh, that aren't going to be viewed necessarily by anybody in particular but me or my wife or somebody, you know. But I would be doing something. I'm not sure exactly how it manifests itself, but um, it would come out in some way. A bit of a dance. Because there are times when you have to withdraw, at least I have to withdraw. I have to go back inside and find my space, check in with myself, see what I need at that moment in time. And sometimes it's just being quiet or doing something totally different. Uh, so I do need to float in and out of those worlds. But I do uh, find, I am a communal person on some levels. And then, as I said, there are times when you just need to be left alone. It's quite a like That's the time, if you know that analogy about the well, and you out in the world, and you're putting out energy, and you're giving out energy, and then the well starts to slowly go down. <laughs> you have to go inside, and you have to refill it. So those are the times when I need to be left alone. Well, the artist is part of society. People look at them as... Uh outside of uh, their uh, way of living, you know. But um, in, a, in a sense, maybe artists is kind of like a, I don't know, the old shamans or the, uh, you know, like druid priests. They, they do things, uh, maybe I'm being over dramatic with it, but um, a lot of people uh, can uh, respond to it, but uh, they also uh, feel that it's not something they can do or, but I know it, it does uh, influence all kinds of things, and it gets uh, rehashed and comes back as something else. You know, like, um, even uh, you know, you see a commercial on TV, which is in a, a kind of an art. You know, and, and it it's taken things from society and rehashed it, and and brings it out in a, another way. You know. I am here in some sort of a mission. Forgive me. Uh, to bring art not to the masses, but make art less fearful. I want to convey to people, I want to show people how I'm getting to do, how I'm doing my art, what drives me, how, what, what, what's the end result of it. And perhaps they will be teased and, and think about, perhaps they are able to do it, or they will try, or maybe pick into it. And, and, and in fact, this video is also expanding the community we have meetings about the artist tour, and other than that, we have very little time to talk to each other artists to find out a little bit about their art and what inspires them and how they create. 
Um, we noticed this a few years ago and for a while had a round table where other artists could, could go to each other's studios. That's very important in this. If it's just simply a matter of going to a meeting and taking care of the details about the tour, that's all well and good. This is really enriching us to be part of a group and to be getting together by the vi video and also individually to see what other artists are about. It's, yeah, I work basically alone, like a writer. You know, I mean, I'm always alone at the board. You know, it's, uh, years ago I had a studio in the city. I had two assistants and, I, you know, I was so overloaded with work that, uh, uh, I was in a, a room, maybe 15 by 15, there were three of us. I, I like that, you know, but, but for the past, you know, lately it's been just me, you know, and it's, uh, you know, and the radio, <laughs> me and the radio. But I'm also very connected because of Facebook with a lot of artists now across Europe. And their work is maybe simple, maybe it's form-based, maybe it's sculptural, but there's still such a wide variety of form, and we have a wide variety of artists on our tour and in our area that kind of demonstrate that. The one difference is, you know, we don't all of us reach the kind of recognition that is created by an art market that is now really driven more by money and um, than by the art critics and by the, uh, the kind of intensity there was in the 40s and 50s. Even when I came up as an artist, there were a lot less galleries and there were a lot less artists. Well, decorative art is an oxymoron. It's not the same thing. Decorating has to do with making an object that you're decorating attractive visually or uh, tonally or sensually, however you do it. Uh, art is, about, is talking about life and living and what it means to be a human being. And that's a totally different thing. So there, there is no such thing as decorative art. As you know, I'm a furniture designer. And a lot of people do not necessarily consider that an art form. Some people's definition of art, it must be totally useless. That its only redeeming quality is the fact that it looks pretty, and I want it. If as soon as you start adding utilitarian to it, it becomes, it doesn't really need to be quite so uh, useful in order to justify, or it doesn't have to be so pretty to justify its existence. All the things I build are primarily useful, and they're there for a reason. Though I have to say is, I don't see why a piece of furniture or something I have in my house can't look pretty. And there's also some uh, design criteria in a piece of furniture that if they're done wrong, they just don't look right. And if they're done correctly for somehow the piece works. So uh, that's how art sits and I'm constantly fighting people uh, with what is what I do really art. There's uh, a very blurry line between the art and the functionality. The form really does help to confine you to um, parameters, but beyond that, anything can happen within. So while something may have the form of a bowl, it doesn't stop there. It can be embellished. It could be manipulated. It can be subtracted from and added to. So while it's a basic form, everything uh, possible can happen to it. So I don't really see that there is a significant difference. And yet, it may be functional, and then some artists prefer that their things remain non-functional. My work is usually functional. It's not, it's not the same. It's basically you have an assignment. You have uh, all kinds of parameters and deadlines, and, uh, uh, and you, there's money involved. And uh, right off the bat, before, you know, it's not that I'm doing pieces of art and, like, hanging them up somewhere, and hopefully somebody will buy them. 
So in that respect, there's a big difference. There's a big difference. When I do something on my own, a piece of fine art, a painting, whatever, it's usually for me. And if somebody likes it and they want it, uh, they, could, they could purchase it. But the world of illustration is, uh, it's like, a, it's a commission. It's, uh, that's what it is, you know. Uh, what's happening in the art world and also the social media world, since I'm involved in both, is very interesting. They're getting connected. I'm involved with LinkedIn a lot. I wrote the book on LinkedIn. It's called Mastering LinkedIn in Seven Days or Less. And I use it a lot myself. And just the other day, I went to LinkedIn to ask people in my network who are in the, also in the art world how they're using social media and what difference it's made to them. Many of them were saying they're using it now to get clients and also to connect with other artists and design people and interior designers. So it's another way that we're able to be connected. What you asked us to do is to think about how, uh, what about uh, us in the art world today and how it's changing. And I have to say it, it is radically changing. And I can think of technology is the critical thing uh, in one form or another. Technology has allowed, uh, if you think about it, uh, up until recently, uh, the average fellow could not print a color printing. You could take a photograph, but he couldn't create a print. Well, that's now relatively commonplace. There's Vistaprint. There's all these places that you can send your photographs or your, your artwork to and replicate it over and over. Uh, there are CDs. Everybody can burn their own CDs now. And uh, books publishing, uh, soul publishing, and things of that nature uh, allows only art to be brought to the average fellow uh, relatively inexpensively. Uh, yet there used to be a time where book publishers, CD publishers, and music people would filter out the not so good quality. They'd insist on a book designer. They'd insist on editors. They would even publish books that were not. So all of the uh, Sony would not uh, create a CD or a record. Uh, that was not mastered correctly or properly. Uh, so we've got a lot of stuff out in the field today that is really of dubious quality, yet it's readily available. It's all about the co computer. Although I'm one of the remaining dinosaurs that actually work at the drawing board and do all my art, I do my art not on the computer. Every now and again, I do some line work and I have it digitally colored, which is okay with uh, lots of people. And the clients that I've maintained over the years, they, uh, they buy it. They, they accept the way I work today. Uh, I'm going to a presentation by seniors, uh, two of which are artists, and they're both presenting multimedia work. And so my question to them is why? And I think the answer is, that there is a, a sense, of course, I got to hear the answer. I don't know what the answer is, but th th there's a sense in which we feel attached to our instruments. We walk around now and we're dangling, uh, you know, we look like uh, some kind of electronic engineer uh, between our iPhone and our uh, pad and our laptop and whatever else is going on. Uh, uh, and so uh, I, I think that young people feel that there is no one particular discipline that will really tell today's story, that you have to combine, uh, and, and also not only visual things, but visual and music and, 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 all, and literary stuff, a lot of very mixed type of presentation. Uh, I'm still naive enough to, to want to explore what you can do if you really limit your materials. And as a matter of fact, uh, I, what I'm currently working on is just lines. I'm no longer making shapes. And I'm just trying to do lines and see how much I can make a line significant. I do see changes in the watercolor field. It's interesting, just last week I was looking through some watercolor magazines that I got from my mother, who was also an artist. 
and some of them are from 2000, 2002. And the articles, the content and the styles, everything is very different from the current magazines. What I find is art is more accessible to everyone now. Thanks to PBS and art magazines, people are inspired to do art and they also now have the way to learn the techniques. So people are really encouraged to express themselves and try out new things. Um, I used to only work in steel. Then I slowly started to work. This is over 12, 12 years. I've been working with steel from 87. I've been working with any object from birth to 1987. Then I went from 1987 to 19, uh, early 2000s, basically just using steel and some stone, blue stone. Now I am branched out into anything that I see shape in or the potential shape in to make what I want out of that. I'll use anything. I think photography now is in a great quandary because everyone's doing it. Everybody's doing it from their cell phones. We're a nation obsessed, a world obsessed with images. And there are millions uploaded every day to the internet. So I think the only thing as an artist, as a practicing artist, I'm concerned with what I can say. And only I can say it. So. That's what I'm concerned with. And I think what happens with so many images is that we do not take the time to really look at them, study them, put them together in stories. So I'm interested in doing that as well, how they work as a group. Uh, I don't think anyone knows ever where art is. Uh, I, I think art is a, um, a means of expression and communication, and um, it's um, an attempt of the artist and the viewer, or perceiver, it could be music, uh, to understand something about the wrestling process that we call living our contemporary life at the moment. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, not an artist, is Michelangelo, that guy who did the Sistine Chapel's dome, not an artist? I leave that. And knowing um, how difficult an artist's life can be, when you see success, it feels good for everyone who knows the person. So I do find that to be inspiring. Okay. Art is more accessible to us, and at the same time, we are, as artists, are more involved in everything we do with our art, in every aspect. For example, galleries used to sell our work. Now they don't do as much, there aren't as much, there isn't as much of that, and we're much more involved in finding out what our message is, articulating that message, doing the marketing, promoting ourselves, and all this that someone else used to do for us. And you could become like the prisoner of the uh, material. And so I found a way of working with it where I was less a prisoner and could uh, deal with my own construction of form. Or if you see my older work, I got to the point where, um, you know, there's just so much you could do with, uh, with the tools I had, like a half inch piece of steel. And with the uh, thinner material, it has enough body, but it's, I can manipulate it, you know, it's easier. Because when you build what you work in and work for what you work in, the energy's got to come from a deeper place, you know? There's an intimacy that I have with my studio, is my sanctuary. And I have things that I use, I have tools that I use that were given to me by my mentor, who's still friend at the time. Did you ever think of doing tattoos? It's funny you should mention that. Yes. <laughs> Only I wanted to do it for kids and call it tattoons. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, like have my little creatures. Uh -huh. But it wouldn't be like with the needle. It would be like more like cockamamies, we used to call them, you know, uh, where they could put them on and stay for a week and wash them off. But, you know, even though everybody got a tattoo, not me yet. I think the, the capacity for people to appreciate the eternal 
aspect of real beauty is a transforming concept that goes beyond the geopolitical you know, problems of our world. Maybe the sculptors are luckier than the painters because if we do blow ourselves up or incinerate ourselves or the world goes to hell in a handbasket, which it always will be, but our work is more perishable <laughs> And the sculptures might survive, you know, when, uh, you know, the Michael, uh, Michael Chacon's work is going to be around longer than, than my canvases. And, and maybe I have to beat him up about that a little bit. And I think people will be pleasantly surprised with the level of work that's being done and the seriousness of the artists in this area. Uh, I came here with some sort of a mission, with that notion that I want to bring art to, to everyday people and show how art is connected to everyday and is the real religion. Why? Because it's the religion you can deny it with itself.